Okay, so for today, for the mass spec portion of Chemistry 729, I want to talk to you all about uh, ionization sources that we have here at USM. Uh, last time we talked a little bit about ionization sources, and I told you all that you learned about electron ionization or electron impact, as you might have called it, as in, in your undergraduate coursework. But we're not going to talk about that here because we really don't have uh, an electron ionization source within uh, our department. We have uh, MALDI electrospray ionization, as we talked a little bit about last time, and also uh, APCI, or atmospheric pressure coronal uh, ionization. So we'll talk a little bit about those uh, today and talk a little bit about the um, analyzers that are, that are coupled to these instruments. And then we will wrap up for today and talk about uh, some additional things in the, uh, in the last video that we'll, we'll get to uh, in a week or so. So what I wanted to talk about first was, was MALDI. So as you all will remember, that stood for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization. And MALDI is a technique, it is a soft ionization technique, so it doesn't uh, fragment, uh, to, at least to a large degree, um, molecules. And it is one of the favorites of the biochemists. They really do like uh, MALDI. So biochemists like MALDI and uh, polymer scientists also like so your polymer science folks really like MALDI. Uh, MALDI is really good at um, uh, determining the molecular weight of high molecular weight uh, uh, molecules like proteins, peptides, uh, and synthetic polymers. So I want to describe for you all how the MALDI process works. It's still a little bit of a magical black box for a lot of people. Um, but if you were to go into our uh, mass spec room, uh, you would see the MALDI uh, um, instrument, and we have these plates. So I'll just draw a plate that's not perfectly square, but th they are square uh, or rectang uh, rectang rectangular uh, plates that have places for you to put uh, your various samples on. Uh, so you, we, we say we spot samples on the MALDI plate and you would typically spot a series of standards. You have to calibrate the MALDI uh, every time you use it. You don't have to calibrate the uh, ESI system. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. And so what you would do is you would take your sample or your analyte that you're interested in and you would mix it with a matrix. So you would take your sample plus your matrix and you would mix those together and you would apply that spot onto the MALDI plate. And you would put that MALDI plate into the instrument and then you would analyze that particular spot that you made uh, using uh, the laser. Okay. So what happens is your sample becomes a crystalline solid and the laser beam will strike that particular uh, spot. So you've got a camera in there where you can actually um, move the laser and you actually physically shoot your sample with uh, our, our laser beam, if you will. That cre uh, creates a, a hot spot, if you will. So the matrix um, uh, has an aromatic ring in it. It absorbs that UV light from the laser. It heats up extremely hot and under vacuum, then this explodes and you get molecules coming off of your plate. And those molecules plus the matrix are coming off of your plate. The matrix uh, is typically an acid and so it will transfer a proton from the carboxylic acid portion of the matrix to your molecule. And so MALDI is very good at giving M plus H plus ions. So Z is almost always going to be equal to plus one uh, for a MALDI uh, spectrum. Not always, sometimes you'll pick up more than one charge. But by and large, you will get a uh, charge uh, state on your, on your molecule of one, which makes the analysis of the molecule pretty easy. And this is one of the reasons why the biochemists like it so much, because the protein only picks up one charge and you can, you can see the molecular weight pretty easily. Um, so that's how the process works on the plate. Now how are these ions analyzed uh, in the MALDI? Well, in our particular setup, we have what's called a MALDI-TOF. So I should put a hyphen up here and put TOF, 
which stands for time of flight. So our analyzer is nothing more than a pipe. Okay, so above that plate is a pipe, and I'm drawing it horizontally, but actually these things are vertical in our, in our system, so it runs up and down, not side to side as we have it here. In the front of this pipe is what we call a gate, and on this side of the pipe is what we call a detector. Okay, so we've got the detector on this side. Now the ions from our uh, laser blast, right, they're in the gas phase and they're in front of the gate. And so uh, the gate will open up and let these ions through and it accelerates them down the, um, down the pipe. And so as you have different ions coming down the pipe, they will strike the detector at different times. And so really all this experiment is, is determining the time that it takes for an ion to travel from the gate to the detector, and it's usually in picoseconds. It's actually quite quick. The uh, computers and the electronics have to be very fast to detect this. So once the gate opens, that's at time equals zero, and then um, when it strikes the detector, that time will be proportional to the mass to charge ratio. Okay, so think about it like a horse race. A light uh, horse can run faster than a heavy horse, and so that's all we're doing. We're measuring the time that it takes for these ions to strike the detector. And so it's a very simple experiment in theory. This pipe, which is nothing more than a pipe, costs several thousand dollars actually, uh, tens of thousands of dollars if we were to have to replace it. Uh, but it's, it's that expensive because the um, uh, pipe it has to be a very uh, defined length and made out of very special materials that can handle uh, the corrosive nature of, of what we're doing to it. Um, this is also the reason why we have to add calibrants to each of our samples every time we run a MALDI. So every time you would run a MALDI experiment, some of these spots that you would have, you would put actually calibrants that you use to calibrate the instrument. Because as you can imagine, if you'll remember your physics, um, materials expand and contract with temperature. And so today the temperature in the lab may be hotter than it was yesterday, and so the pipe's actually gonna be just a little bit longer. And that small amount of difference in length Deter, uh, will make a significant change in the time that it takes for the molecule to reach the detector. So that's how the uh, moldy TOF works. Let's talk a little bit about matrices uh, or the matrix that you need. There are a couple of rules that you need to follow when you're picking a matrix. The first thing that I will say is that there are tons of matrices out there on the market and a lot of times you have to uh, by trial and ex, uh, you know trial and error, determine which matrix is going to work best for your particular molecule. Having said that, there are two common ones that just about everybody starts with. The first one is called DHB or dihydroxybenzoic acid, and it has an aromatic ring. Of course, it's a benzoic acid. So you've got this carboxylic acid functional group. And then it is in the two position and the five position you have the dihydroxy. Okay? It's a solid and so when you mix it with your sample and spot it on the plate it will crystallize and form uh, crystals. Uh, the aromatic ring will allow the uh, light from the laser to get absorbed. That, that absorption of that laser light causes the sample to heat up and it bursts and uh, explodes basically releasing your uh, analyte plus the um, matrix molecules in, um, uh, in the gas phase. And so during that process, through a mechanism that I'm not quite clear on, the proton can actually get transferred to your analyte. So this works really well for analytes that have uh, Lewis basic sites like carbonyls and amides and things that you might find in both synthetic polymers and in uh, biomolecules. So it works really well for that type of thing. Another one that you need to keep in mind is what we call alpha cyano. And it is a cinnamic acid derivative, also known as cinnapinic acid, by the way. But it is this conjugated system with a nitrile there on the alpha position, or cyano group. Uh, so that we call this uh, alpha cyano. 
Uh, and this particular molecule is actually quite good for things like uh, proteins and peptides. People will quite frequently start with alpha cyano and DHB is a good place to start with something like uh, synthetic polymers. So some of the advantages of Maldi-Toff over some of the other ones, obviously we talked about the fact that Z is equal to 1 most of the time, not always. Uh, and so that makes um, the interpretation of your spectra quite straightforward. So if you imagine having a spectrum where on the y-axis you're looking at intensity, on the x-axis you're looking at the mass to charge ratio, um, and for a MALDI typically we start at around 600 for mass to charge, and this can go out to, you know, 10,000 to 100,000 uh, AMU or mass to charge ratio units out here. So it, uh, the electronics on this are actually quite good to get very high molecular weights and what you'll see then is a peak uh, for your sample. So maybe you have a protein that appears there. Uh, or if you have a polymer what you'll notice is that you'll start to see a series of peaks. And I'm exaggerating these of course uh, because as you know a synthetic polymer has a number of repeat units and those those differ from um, strand to strand and so you can actually determine what your polymer is by looking at the delta M here which is the uh, equivalent of your mass of your monomer so you can actually get uh, all kinds of information from a uh, MALDI spectrum of a synthetic polymer you can get the um, uh, PI you can get the PDI, you can identify the monomer by delta M, you can get the average molecular weight, you can do all kinds of analysis. You can even look at in-group analysis. And we're not going to talk about those details today. I just want you to understand that you actually can get an awful lot of information on synthetic polymers uh, from a MALDI spectrum uh, quite easily. So. Um, that's all I really wanted to say in terms of the benefits of MALDI. There are a couple of things that, in my opinion, detract from MALDI. And one of those things, they're the negatives, if you will. So there's a couple of negatives. And one of those is there's ion suppression issues. So if your um, molecule has things like phosphates or sulfates, things that don't go into the gas phase very well, uh, this happens to our biochemistry friends who are using buffers. If those buffers have phosphate in them, you will typically get diminished signal in the MALDI uh, because the phosphate will uh, form uh, clusters, if you will, with the molecule and not um, allow it to ionize so readily. So there are substantial need or uh, issues with ion suppression and you really need to focus on uh, making sure you have as clean a possible sample. So biochemists will quite frequently desalt their samples through a variety of techniques before they actually run the MALDI uh, mass spec. So you, you know you have ion suppression issues, you need very you know usually fairly clean samples. Uh, if you're talking about synthetic polymers you have to have low molecular weight distributions. So usually you can't get away with a, a highly molecular, or high uh, molecular weight distribution profile in, in uh, MALDI. You usually have to have that down uh, to a uh, reasonable uh, level, which we can talk about more uh, during our help session that we're going to schedule. Um, low molecular weight molecules are also limited. As I mentioned earlier, typically you start somewhere around 600. This is the gate cutoff, so you want to usually exclude anything that's under 600 for a MALDI analysis because, again, we're using these low molecular weight matrices. Uh, we don't want them to contaminate, so typically you set this at 600 or below to, to keep these from getting into the uh, analyzer, and so it deflects uh, anything lower than 600 and these things will form clusters with each other and uh, you can have you know not just one peak but several peaks that will actually appear lower than this they can really uh, overwhelm the system if you if you don't exclude them uh, and also the, the thing that I find the most troubling with MALDI in my opinion it's hard to hyphenate 
So while we do have Maldi TOF, where the TOF is the analyzer, it's very hard to hyphen. It's hard to connect a GC to this, for example. It's hard to connect an HPLC to this particular uh, type of, uh, of, of um, uh, mass spec instrumentation. So usually if you want to do uh, liquid chromatography MALDI, you actually have to run the chromatogram on a separate instrument, collect your peaks, blow them down, concentrate them, and then spot them on the MALDI plate. So you can't really do it as a hyphenated uh, process. So um, those are some things that in my opinion detract from it. So for, for those of you like me who deal largely with low molecular weight uh, compounds, you're probably going to want to stay away from MALDI and you're probably going to want to use our other instrument which is what we call the LXQ which has electrospray ionization and atmospheric pressure coronal ionization or APCI which I'm going to talk to you about in just a moment. Give me just a moment to erase and I'll return. Okay well we're back and so the next technique that I want to talk about is electrospray ionization or ESI. Uh, as you can imagine uh, electrospray and ionization uh, tells you a little bit of something about this particular technique. Your sample would be placed in liquid uh, and that would then be sprayed through a um, needle and as it goes through the needle there is actually a, a charge that is placed on the needle and I, it's hard for me to actually describe it. It's actually in your reading assignment drawn quite nicely. So just trust me for right now that there's actually a needle that your sample is passing through that's, that's metal uh, and it's charged to several thousand volts. Okay, so it's a very high voltage charge. And as those droplets uh, pass through there, they have, they're, of course, they're charged because your sample ends up being charged because you add acid to the, to the solution. And as they exit the needle, they get repelled towards the heated capillary of the system. I'm going to over exaggerate this so we're going to call this our heated capillary which is actually uh, got voltage on it as well to attract the sample and as these things start coming out of the sample they get smaller and smaller and smaller until all of the solvent has basically been removed and then the droplets will go through the heated capillary removing the rest of the solvent and what comes out the end is your molecule in some charge state. And we'll talk about what that charge is in just a moment. And in our process, uh, or at least our instrument I should say, this then goes into the analyzer which in our case is an ion trap. Now we're not going to talk an awful lot about the ion trap, but what you need to know is that it is what it says it is. It's going to trap your ions and then it's going to expel them from the trap to the detector when certain conditions are met depending on the mass to charge ratio. So the trap, it's an ion cyclotron, it actually spins your uh, ions around in a circular motion. When we change the parameters on the trap to where it throws a particular mass to charge ratio out that then goes and hits the detector. The detector then gives a signal to the computer and since we know what the parameters were on the ion trap we know what the mass to charge ratio was of that thing that hit the detector. This all happens very very quickly. The ion trap has several advantages. Uh, number one you can run what's called MS to the N spectra so you can actually expel everything that you don't want and then actually look at the ions that you do want and you can actually interrogate them. You can force them to break apart. You could take this soft ionization technique then apply energy to the trap in a way that actually breaks the molecule apart and you can look at the daughters and you can do that you know three, four, five times down down the tree if you will. So it works very well uh, for that and it works uh, quite nicely for um, a whole whole range of molecules actually. Now ESI works really well for polar molecules. Okay, so that would include biomolecules. 
it does not work so well for nonpolar molecules. So things that are just, you know, carbon and hydrogen aren't going to work very well on electrospray ionization. You need things like carbonyls or amides. Um, alcohols will work to some, some degree. You need something polar that the uh, molecule can pick up a proton or some other type of charging agent. So protons are the common charging agent. So you can imagine if a proton reacts with a carbonyl, for example, right? You're going to end up with a charged species that can uh, be detected by our detector. And so these molecules are almost always um, positively charged. You can run negative ion ESI. I'm going to just limit this to positive ions for today, uh, just to keep things simple. And so like I mentioned, this thing works really well for biomolecules. And if you think about a typical biomolecule, so let's just use a, the snake diagram of a protein. right? So a protein has an N terminus. It has a carboxylic acid terminus. And then usually within the structure of the protein, you know, there's going to be other nitrogens or amides. I'm just going to focus on some nitrogens here. So let's say lysine residues or something like that. Uh, and as you can imagine, we have multiple sites that could be protonated. And so we actually see what's called a multiple charged envelope or an MCE in many of our mass specs that we do of large molecules like this. Uh, and it kind of complicates the uh, uh, spectrum a little bit, but it actually has some advantages as well. So if we were to take a look at this particular molecule by mass spec, we would see again several peaks. And this isn't, you know, an NMR spectrum, but let's see, we got one, two, three, we got four, uh, five places in theory that could pick up a charge, right? So let's just say we have uh, five peaks. They're all the same molecule. So each one of these is the same molecule, but in a different charge state. So this would be the mass of the molecule plus a proton, right? This would be um, so on and so forth as you, as you go down. This would be the mass of the molecule plus two protons, right, which would be half the molecular weight distance or mass to charge distance. I don't have this drawn to scale. This would be the plus three, the plus four, the plus five. Okay, so we could see all of our states in that particular mass spectrum. Now, like I said, this is called a multiple charged envelope. It's all one molecule, uh, but this has some advantages. Number one, you actually are doing multiple experiments here and so you can get very accurate mass to charge ratios because you can determine the mass to charge of each one of these independently. So it's like running five experiments in one scan, which you can't do on the MALDI because you only have a single charge state. Uh, and you can deconvolute this. So if you know the mass to charge ratio of a high molecular weight peak, or an apparent high molecular weight peak, and you know the mass to charge ratio of a low molecular weight peak, you can actually determine the Z value for the low using the equation that is in your reading assignment. So look at that equation in the JChem Ed paper. And we will talk about this during our scheduled um, help session that we'll have later on uh, in the semester. But you can then use this to determine this equation that you're going to read about. You can use that to determine what the charge state is of this particular peak. And once you assign that, then you know the charge states of all of the other peaks. And you can then determine the molecular weight of each one of these peaks. And you can average them together and you can actually get a fairly high level of accuracy in your uh, molecular weight determination by ESI. ESI also has uh, the advantage here because ion traps do not have the resolution that a TOF has. Uh, and so these typically can only detect things up to about 2,000, maybe 4,000 depending on the trap uh, as a mass to charge ratio. And so you might be thinking, well, how in the world then do we determine high molecular weight species on an ion trap? Well, it's because we have this multiple charged envelope and the more charges you have 
right? So it's mass to charge. So the higher the charge ratio, the lower the mass to charge ratio is going to be, and you can actually get it within that window for the ion trap. So you can actually run things that are 60,000 molecular weight very easily on an ion trap that can only detect up to a mass to charge ratio of two to 3,000 very easily. Uh, the other thing that is an advantage for having multiple charges is the detector sensitivity. So the detector works by when the uh, charged particle hits the detector, it releases electrons that are detected by an electron multiplier. And uh, so this detector is actually called a dynode. Uh, and uh, the more charges that hit the detector, the more electrons come off for that electron multiplier uh, to detect and multiply. So you can imagine if you have something that has five charges on it, you can get better sensitivity, you can detect it at lower concentration than you can with MALDI. So even though MALDI can go down very, very low, electrospray ionization, with good clean samples anyway, uh, you can get very, very um, sensitive uh, detections. We've been able to detect things down into the, the micromolar range is very, very easy to do. You can get down into the nanomolar and picomolar range if you're very, very careful with how you set up your experiments. So uh, this is basically what I wanted to talk about today in terms of ESI. The other thing that I want to talk about really quickly with our LXQ system, which is the ion trap and the detector, is we can actually run what's called APCI on that particular system as well. So atmospheric pressure, coronal ionization. And so the ion trap works exactly the same. The detector works exactly the same. It's how you get the ions that's different. So electrospray, as I mentioned, works really well for polar molecules, things like biomolecules. APCI, however, works very well for things that are of low polarity. So nonpolar molecules, not completely nonpolar, but low polarity molecules. So this really works very, very well for some typical, you know, organic molecules that you might make in a uh, synthesis lab. And the ion trap can actually go down low enough, whereas the MALDI couldn't because of the 600 molecular weight cutoff. You can actually do this, and this kind of mimics very well um, things like uh, GCMS uh, are, are, can typically be replaced by what's called APCI. So I'm not going to go into a whole lot of the details. You can run APCI in um, uh, on polar, or um, excuse me, on nonpolar molecules, and you can run it basically like you do for ESI. You can detect in both the positive and negative mode, although uh, positive is more common than the negative mode. And this one works for the nonpolar molecules, whereas ESI works for the polar molecules. You have to put different heads on to make this work. Uh, uh, Ms. Masterson will train you on how to do that if you ever need to use that particular setup uh, in, our, in our laboratories. Uh, and we've used APCI uh, quite frequently. It's a, it's a very good technique. It's very sensitive, just like electrospray ionization. So those are the things that I wanted to talk about today. You've got a better understanding of, of matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization and how that works. You've got a better understanding of electrospray ionization and what it's uh, good for, uh, and APCI as well. I will say another advantage of these two techniques is that these are easily hyphenated because your samples are in liquid. You can imagine just hooking up your HPLC system uh, directly to the probe head. And as the HPLC has the peaks come out, you can then detect those. And so that's very, very nice if you are doing things where you're separating uh, molecules by uh, either uh, HPLC or gel filtration. Uh, uh, chromatography of some sort, you can actually couple that with uh, these uh, techniques and hyphenate them very, very nicely. So you can't really do that directly with, with MALDI. So this is a very uh, big advantage for that particular, um, for this particular uh, suite of instruments that we have, the SI and the APCI. So for next time, we're going to talk about how we can actually use chemistry to our advantage to better detect molecules. We're going to talk about uh, how we can be clever, if you will, uh, to um, get the things that we want to get out of our experiments, things that we need to be able to observe better. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we can use chemistry coupled with ESI, APCI, or MALDI to improve the sensitivity, improve the detection, 
and we're going through this all very very quickly uh, and if you're more interested in uh, learning more about this uh, let Dr. Schroeder know that you're interested in taking my mass spec class uh, during one of the intercessions maybe we can get that scheduled and we can actually spend a little more time talking about the details of all of these pieces that I've been talking about in block diagrams so um, continue your reading uh, you'll want to read uh, the, the materials that I have in the uh, canvas shell if you haven't done that already and I will see you all uh, during the next video thank you